Hey everyone, it's Carlos PC747. Thanks so much for watching. This video is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to talk about how to really land an airplane. I gave about 5,000 hours of instruction and I learned a couple things. And some of the things I'm going to share you won't see in any book. And at the end of the video, I hope that it helps those of you who are learning how to fly and those of us who, although we already know how to fly, might learn a thing or two as well. One of the things I noticed as a flight instructor is that new students were simply overwhelmed with the amount of information they had to try and comprehend while trying to learn to land an airplane for the first time. When I was a brand new flight instructor, I did the same thing. I was providing too much information, a fire hose of information, and the student was listening but not really doing what they needed to do and I was intervening. Like this instructor had to do so nothing bad happened. Over time, I realized that in order to be more effective as a flight instructor, I had to first establish foundations that the students could rely on before putting them all together. I wish a flight instructor had asked me the following question. In a no-win condition, what would cause the airplane to drift to the left? Likewise, in a no-win condition, what would cause the airplane to drift to the right? Here's the answer. The right wing is lower than the left. If you're drifting to the left, the left wing is lower than the right. Ailerons control drift. How a student flies is a reflection of the instruction that they have received. In this clip, you will see what happens when a weak understanding of aircraft control usage is present. As the pilot gets closer, the aircraft is drifting to the left and he is not initiating corrective measures at all. The lack of decisive aileron and rudder usage demonstrates a lack of understanding of basic control usage. That combined with the delay in executing a go-around in a timely fashion is cause for concern. Do you think he had adequate judgment to solo? A lack of proper control applications resulted in a deviation here, too. As you may already know, the way most pilots are taught to land aircraft is through rote techniques, having high angles of attack, having the yoke pulled back, listening for the stall warning horn, or covering up the runway. A far better way is applying a correlative technique that you will not find in any book. Since all aircraft except fighters approaching at the correct speed have approximately 10 seconds of kinetic energy after the power is reduced to idle, have them count to 10 out loud. The numbers one through five are indicative of low angles of attack, high kinetic energy, and an aircraft that is not ready to land. The numbers six through 10 are indicative of higher angles of attack, lower kinetic energy, and an aircraft that is ready to land. When I incorporated this correlative landing technique for my own students, it lowered their time to solo by about three hours. But before I would have a student attempt to control the aircraft on three axis, I wanted them to master one axis at a time. I would set the aircraft five feet above the runway, and then I would ask the student just to keep the aircraft there. This afforded students far more time to work on their finesse than they would normally have with the power off. That never took me more than two circuits before they were proficient. Then, during the third approach, I would have them follow through with me as I would commence counting out loud after the flare so they could understand the correlation between numbers and when a plane is ready to land. Something you may not know is that most aircraft, except fighters, after you reduce the power to idle and flare, have about 10 seconds of stored kinetic energy with which to land. This holds true for the smallest aircraft all the way up to the largest, from Taylor Craft and Cessna 152s up to the 747, the 777, and the Airbus 
aircraft. Getting my students to solo sooner wasn't just the incorporation of a correlative landing technique. It was also the incorporation of single access training to proficiency. Before moving on, I would do this with the elevators first, then the ailerons, then the rudder. Why? Because not doing it results in a lot of wasted effort. There is a tremendous amount of flight time spent trying to teach students how to land in all three axes quickly. And that, in my opinion, is the problem because a lot of errors are made and a lot of interventions are having to be performed so that nothing bad happens. It would be better for instructors to concentrate on single axis training to proficiency first before moving on. Some people may ask, well, how do you do single axis training with the ailerons? Well, I'll tell you. On final, I would deliberately have the aircraft not on the extended center line. I would then ask the student to fly through the extended center line to the other side. With my feet on the rudders and their hands on the hand controls, then I would ask them to go the other way through the extended center line and we'd repeat again and again. Two circuits in the pattern were typically all that was required for them to show proficiency. Some people might ask, well, how do you do single axis training with the rudder? Well, I'll tell you. While I was flying the aircraft, I would ask them to place their feet on the rudder pedals. And at the same time, I would ask them to sit on their hands so that they wouldn't have the temptation of trying to control the aircraft in the other two axes. I would then side slip from side to side through the extended center line. At first, the nose would not stay straight when I started the turns, but soon enough, it would always stay straight because they knew what to expect. What's my takeaway from all this? Rote landing techniques are indeed one way of landing an aircraft. It's been going on for a long time, but it's certainly not the most efficient way. Could an application of the correlative landing technique have helped this pilot. How about this aircraft? Would an understanding of kinetic energy have helped him? Let me know. See if you can identify some of the problems this pilot had during this landing. I want to commend the pilot for exercising good judgment and executing a go-around when he did. When it all comes together, there should be no question as to the student's understanding of how the aircraft's controls work or as to their judgment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One final thing that I'd like to add in closing, there is no such thing as perfection in the aviation industry or anywhere else. When I was learning to fly long ago, None of my own flight instructors shared their mistakes with me. So naturally, I thought they were perfect. And that's far from true. And that is a pity because there is a lot that can be gleaned by providing a little self-deprecation for a lot of students who are already stressed, nervous, maybe even intimidated by their flight instructor. And by bringing yourself down a little, it might help them relax and appreciate that everybody makes mistakes, including flight instructors, and it might help them connect with their instructors even more in the learning process. If you like this video, please let me know. Please like and subscribe. Take care.